Well, I uh, very much look forward to the second session uh, of this morning on this topic. Uh, we're aiming to stop by 1.30. Uh, a couple of the panellists have to go, and I suspect uh, people might just be getting a bit hungry by then. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll uh, try and work so the speakers talk for about eight minutes each with some time left for Q&A. So if I could introduce the speakers, uh, if I do it briefly, I hope you don't mind, uh, because uh, full details are in the program. But uh, no, well, we've had to shorten it, you see. Well, I'm sure you, I'm sure you can keep it brief to eight, you think? The others did too. Eight minutes, yeah. yeah. OK. If I could uh, go down, Alex Hawke, who is uh, the federal member for Mitchell, uh, a young member of parliament, uh, Liberal Party. Look forward to hearing his views. Greg Sheridan, uh, I think, is you know, very well known to those in the foreign policy community as probably the uh, most senior uh, foreign policy uh, editorial journalist uh, in Australia. So uh, very much look forward to hearing you, Greg. Um, Mr. Jude Pereira, who's the state member for Cranbourne, the Australian Labor Party, uh, of Sri Lankan origin, and I think the only Sri Lankan in any lower house in the country. Uh, and uh, I have to say how much we appreciate your coming on this panel, sir. Um, Mr. Rashid Alvi, who's a member of Parliament, a member of the Rajya Sabha, the upper house in the uh, Indian Parliament. Uh, he's from Uttar Pradesh and has also been in the lower house. Um, and also he is a spokesman for the Congress party. Um, Nirmala Sita Raman, who is uh, originally from Tamil Nadu, but now lives in Hyderabad, and she's a spokesman for the opposition BJP party. So I think we should get a very wide range of views, both uh, from an Indian perspective, an Indian political perspective, and an Australian political perspective. So without more, uh, Alex, you're the first on my list. If you'd like to come up, thank you. No, you can, you can sit, speak from here. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> or relax stand there. if um, you prefer. Um, look, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. It's um, very privileged uh, of me to be sitting between two such eminent uh, people in relation to foreign affairs. But I'm happy to be here today as one of the younger federal members of parliament uh, to give you a little bit of perspective about some of my thoughts about the Australian-Indian relationship in the future and indeed uh, some of the things in Australia I think that could make a very big difference to that. Um, Greg would be particularly pleased to hear that I'm an enthusiast, a strong enthusiast for the Australian-Indian relation. I think there's a lot that can be done um, from a government perspective um, to enhance it and make sure that it is going to be the vibrant uh, thing that it is destined to be. Uh, it's great to meet some of the Indian members of Parliament who are here. Uh, and I've got to say, even just in our informal discussions and just arriving here, there are some great similarities between our two countries apparent in our views on the media, our views on regulation and problems that we're having. And can I say the problems we're hearing about Indian politics and Australian politics, there are similarities that just aren't there and when, uh, with other countries. Uh, and when I go to Japan, and I've led a, a delegation to Japan, you know, we have a great trading relationship, a great history, but we just don't have that same cultural exchange or that ability to understand each other in the same way that I believe we do even just meeting each other. So what do I say about the future? I say looking forward, as a young Member of Parliament, there are a couple of areas that I think are going to be vital um, for India and Australia. Uh, some of them are obvious and some of them will have been talked about at great length at this conference and others are nuances that I would bring, uh, being a Liberal and being, I think, of a different generation to many people that you may have heard from. Um, the first would be, of course, uh, and one of the topics that inspired me from your papers and what you're talking about, can Indian interest in Australia as an education destination be reignited, um, uh, that is one of the things that I believe is going to be critical uh, for uh, the relationship between Australia and India. And when you look at what's happened uh, to the foreign student situation uh, from Australia's perspective, I think it's an example of government and regulatory failure on an epic scale. 
So I'm an advocate, of course, for markets and trade being the best basis for firm relationships between states. Uh, and the education export industry from Australia was perhaps the most uh, optimistic cause for celebration uh, for Australians and Indians. Uh, given it reached about $14 billion, it was a burgeoning and booming industry. Uh, and certainly reached a height and a level of success that uh, was not achieved by any other sector uh, in a faster period of time. And so it's my view, of course, that government uh, really created some of the problems that came about uh, with the, uh, in, in, in the late 2000s. And uh, government has now uh, really been responsible for reducing this sector uh, to something that is um, not as uh, exciting as it once was. Uh, and that might be odd to, for some of you to hear that. I mean, many of you will say, well, the media is to blame. But, you know, I think it's a great attraction of both of our democracies that the free press is so free and aggressive, even as a politician subject to constant aggressive media and free media inquiries. Um, I don't believe it was based uh, solely on the media's reporting of what happened. Uh, and I'm quite uh, integrally uh, connected with the vocational education and training sector, uh, including the private providers. And I think now it's really a market-based problem. Uh, that is, government not allowing the right product to be offered uh, to the right market. And that's why we're seeing a lot of Indian students looking at Canada and other jurisdictions uh, rather than Australia. Uh, what you really have is a market issue uh, that could be resolved by government relaxing and getting out and deregulating, uh, where appropriate, uh, this sector. So that's a controversial view, especially in the vocational education and training sector, but I do think that the ideology that's been injected by some recent governments into this sector um, has probably produced uh, billions of dollars of lost revenue for our country and uh, limited our cultural development uh, as two states and two separate states. So I'm a very big advocate of the vocational education and training sector and, and the private sector offering as much uh, good education uh, pathways for Indian students uh, for, to Australia as we can provide. The second area I'd sort of name is another very controversial area. I enjoy being controversial. And I think just like John, who's retired, who's able to say a lot of controversial things, I think at my age and stage I'm also able to say things that uh, may not be able to be offered up. Uh, and that is, I believe uh, that the destinies of our two countries are going to be intertwined because Australia has a nuclear destiny. And that is something that is not very controversial in India, but very controversial in Australia because of politics, uh, once again. Um, we all know the statistics about the world's uh, deposits of uranium being in Australia, but I believe this ideological opposition to the nuclear industry in Australia, and I don't just mean power generation, I mean uh, the nuclear sciences, uh, medicine and health and all of the technology, science and technology that comes with it, is going to be and destined to be replaced by forward-thinking policies. And there could be any number of drivers to this. Uh, climate change is a very good example. Uh, we now have former heads of Greenpeace and other international green bodies admitting and publicly advocating that they got the question of nuclear power wrong. That they, they had their opposition to this technology and this advancement of the human race um, is, is the next logical step in reducing climate change and reducing emissions and moving us not just to nuclear, but forward into other technologies that come uh, from human advancement. So I know that is a view that is more popular with the younger member of parliament that you get in the federal parliament, especially on my side of politics, but increasingly out of the unions and the labour movement as well, you will find people that are more committed to nuclear power in Australia and committed to the opening up of uh, nuclear technology. And you'll see this at the moment in Queensland and New South Wales, the governments are now uh, removing the restrictions on uranium exploration and export and development um, as fast as they can, I might say, to get and encourage those industries to grow. So I think that is another key area uh, where we will have uh, great um, uh, industrial and trade links. Finally, of course, I think um, the, the, the other is a more geopolitical reason, and that is um, with the rise of the Asian century, I, I think Greg would also be very happy to see that a government has discovered uh, that we have an Asian century coming up, finally. One government's uh, realised and put out a paper on it, and I know Greg's been mentioning it for a decade. But in that new Asian century that is evolving for, uh, for, our, for the world and our region, uh, we are going to be looking for firmer and firmer friends. A and I think there could be no firmer friend in Asia than India. 
Uh, and not just because we are like in language or like in history, but I think we have a very important similarity uh, that has been mentioned here today and I would advocate is probably going to lead to a lot more uh, uh, diplomatic and defence and other links, and that is, of course, our political structures. Uh, and I, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I heard the person here who asked the question about the dismissal, and uh, you know, there's there's many constructs on the dismissal. I, I don't think it would be helpful if I get into a, a different version of that today. But the point I was going to make before uh, you asked that question today, sir, was that um, in our countries, uh, I believe one of the reasons for the fundamental success uh, of our two nation states and the emergent success of India is correct political structure. That is how you arrange your politics uh, and li put limits on power in democracy uh, is probably one of the most fundamental questions. The currents of energy created by production, by trade, by free markets, by uh, na nation states are so powerful that if they are not allied to correct political structure, they can be very dangerous. Uh, and India has a very good political structure. Australia has a very good political structure. And whatever its current weaknesses or current problems or current challenges, um, and I think I'm being asked to speak into this. Yes, you are. Yep, I'm being asked to speak into this. Yep, hello, hello. Great, yep. Um, whatever its current weaknesses or challenges, the fundamentals of our political structure do a couple of things. They limit the ability of politicians to achieve too much power, which I think is fundamental to the success of a state, uh, and they ensure that uh, economic activity and all of the private sector activity uh, can continue without too much interference from government. And that's where I guess I, uh, I differ from John a little bit. I mean, he mentioned his um, uh, sort of a lament about the rise of the political class in the sense that we have the more professional political operative entering politics. Um, I really see that problem uh, not as a rise of a professional politician. I think there is a profession of politics, and I will question John on that. I think there is a worthwhile profession of politics. And I've seen directly very senior business people and other people attempt to enter politics thinking that they understand it and being absolutely crushed by it. I believe there's a profession, there's a study, there's a worthwhile purpose in pursuing government and governance as a profession. But I think the lament that I would share with John is that I think government has gone too far in its scope in extending into too many areas of life. And that is where people lament about this professional polit political class because they are all the time intervening into other sectors. I mean, I'll be very candid. I'll be very happy for uh, business leaders and other people to keep doing what they're doing in the private sector because they're making a much greater difference doing those things. Um, government does not need to be involved. It should be limited to those areas where we need it, where we must have it and where it's essential. Uh, and I've got a strong view about that as a Liberal. But so there are three areas I think that 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 is really, to me, a set of things that I think lay a great foundation for the future uh, of the Indian-Australian relationship. I come from Western Sydney. I grew up in Western Sydney. Uh, and I had uh, uh, kids in my class uh, from Asia and from India um, all through high school. My generation and the generations below them, I think, are much more attuned to the rise of the Asian century. And it doesn't mean we have to speak different languages. Uh, that's not really the main concern. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very vast difference to my father's generation. And my father grew up under the white Australia policy, a totally different construct, and has still uh, odd views to what I have in relation to the region, uh, uh, people, and where we fit in. Um, so that change is happening. Uh, it is, I think, uh, generationally driven. Um, and I think this relationship is going to be very strong and productive. Um, in, in the neighbouring electorate to me, we've got the largest Sikh temple in Australia, um, in Blacktown. Uh, and, you know, the great thing I find that I find most relatable about every person of Indian background, whether they're a migrant to Australia or whether they're an Australian of um, Indian descent, uh, whenever I meet them, uh, I find I get not just two or three, I tend to get three or four or five business cards. Uh, and to me, uh, that is uh, the thing that I identify with them the most, that they are productive people working hard, uh, integrated fully, uh, getting on with their jobs of looking after themselves and their family. Uh, and I find that the great success story of Australia and of Indian migration and Indian um, uh, uh, dealing with Australia. So really, they're my thoughts. So I want to thank you for your time today, John. I know you've been tough on politicians. I'd like to encourage you to keep being tough on politicians. It's a good thing. Uh, we all need to be. Um, and I think I need to hand you this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
Nirmala, I'm not sure whether you need this, but I'll bring it along in case you do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Professor Matu, giving me this opportunity to talk to such an engaging audience. Since yesterday, it's been a learning experience. And for me to be here to share my thoughts, of course, with a restricted time of eight minutes, uh, is going to be a task. Although, of course, one, if you're used to Indian television, which your minister did refer in the morning, uh, you expect it to answer within a fraction of a minute. <laughs> so I'm not sure how far that training is going to help me talk in eight minutes, all that I wanted to tell you all about. Um, Matu had uh, certainly given me a topic, uh, the Indian political system, the political class, and also the way forward. Uh, I'm not sure if I should go in that order, but I'll certainly talk about the political class to begin with. Um, I, I had an intention of tracing it uh, to where it is today it, with a sense of history, but I would confine to defining it as it stands or profiling it as it stands today. Um, you know in India, we have passed a very uh, pioneering legislation where Panchayati Raj, village level democracy has been implemented that you have elected representatives at the village level, then slightly larger bodies, and when you come over to the district administration, even that is directly elected, just as in the urban areas and the corporations and so on, municipal corporations and so on. So if you look at that category of people, where in fact I'm bringing in factors which otherwise would have uh, been well uh, laid out in my scheme of things, but you must put up with a lot of uh, you know, sudden uh, you know, intrusions into the flow of argument that I'm bringing in only because I want to capture certain very important elements to this. Uh, this legislation which made sure that village level democracy is practiced, elected democracy is practiced, also ensured adequate representation for women. Now in that about 33% technically, but then it has expanded to 50% reservation for women at the village level, uh, municipal corporation level and city level have come into place. Similarly, the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe preservation, which is constitutionally even otherwise provided, is also implemented. So you have this very big layer of people who are living in villages, who are getting elected from there, and their total, just to come in with figures which Shankar has uh, you know, sort of uh, set in pace, and I see a great reception for figures here, uh, <laughs> about 1.5 million people at any one point in time represent that layer of elected representatives, therefore forming a very important chunk of the political class. They are directly living in villages, living in municipal areas. They are people who are on everyday contact with their voters. So that's the bottom layer, the most important and critical layer. Above that comes the legislative assembly level, which is your provincial houses, where you have elected representatives coming in and legislating at the state level, because the constitution gives you a, a, a framework for it. The central government has certain central listed items on which they can legislate. The state governments can legislate, the state uh, legislatures can legislate on certain items listed in the constitution as state items. And finally, there are some which come under the concurrent list on which both of them can which is a very tricky area, which most often governments which are more interested in directly administering take over some of the concurrent because the constitution also gives that little margin saying anything in the concurrent, if there is a dispute, would go in the favor of the union. So the concurrent list. So ultimately, the state legislatures, for the second layer from the bottom that I'm talking about when I'm defining the political class, the second layer is of the state legislatures who are expected to legislate and frame laws. Uh, I will bring in one little observation, which is important for my uh, you know, suggestions of what we think as way forward, even here. Legislatures who are voted to bring in legislations end up performing like executives. That's one of the bane of Indian elected democracy because the perceptions have become, my MLA is here for me. My MLA is member of the legislative house, legislative assembly. He's here for me to lay my roads, set my water all right. My sewer is not working, he should be here to do it. Otherwise he doesn't get elected next time, which actually is not his business. 
technically not his business. Most MLAs end up sitting with the constituents and talking about, oh, you need a road here, and somebody else with a higher caste would come and say, why should the road go this way? It should go this way. And the legislator, therefore, ends up a considerable time being given for executive functions, which are not for what he's been elected. So that, that continues, and that is entrenched so much that today you have MLAs performing like municipal corporators, which is not a function. It gets accentuated even further. I mean, that layer, the second layer, consists of about 5,000 to 6,000 people. I'm giving you a broadband. I'm not giving you exact figures. So the, po the, the political class from the bottom is about 1.5 million, then 5,000 here at the state level. And then you go over to the member of parliament level, which consists of about 760, both lower house and upper house put in together. They are supposed to legislate on those items on which the central lists are already provided for. Now, even MPs, members of parliaments in India, end up sitting with their constituents to talk about roads, water, sewers. So if you have an India still, as Jay Panda in the previous session told you about, we are still, still sitting with colonial laws. Why won't we? You're sitting and laying roads rather than sitting and talking about, you know, legislating on effective laws, laws which have to be updated, laws which have to be just dumped, and laws which have to be brought in afresh in the cyber age. So the members of parliament, please let me say the 760 which are add to the 1.5 plus 5,000 plus 760 odd, are all busy laying roads which are not really seen end of the day. I'm being a bit sarcastic, but the fact is uh, uh, that's, that's how it is envisaged and that's how it is practiced. But eventually, if you look at it, the way in which distortions have come into play is because of the power politics, because of the discretionary powers, even at the panchayat level, the village level, the land, the permissions to be given are all given at the village level. So you have many aberrations coming into play where the member of the parliament ensures that if he's got an interest in that particular area, he would ensure his men will get elected as the legislative assembly members and also to the panchayat level. So the panchayat in, in many cases in India have members of parliament's relatives getting elected in the village level as members of parli uh, as member or the panchayat sarpanch. So this link works to the favor of the powerful member of parliament. Why powerful? Because the quantum of money which is legislated upon or which is passed through the money bills, which goes sometimes even to the district level, is enormous compared to what is not being given to those who are getting elect elected at the panchayat level, the village level. Actually, whether it is the state, uh, the directive principles of state policy, which is the primary document of our uh, constitution, or whether it is the 73rd amendment which was made to the constitution, which was envisaging power to be given at the grassroots levels, all of them wanted local governments to be powerful. But Jay Panda, again, representing a regional party, would still not have the answers as to why, if really power had to be decentralized, state governments which have been ruled by regional parties, and I come from Tamil Nadu, which had started this tradition of regional parties even as uh, early as 1960s, still have not succeeded in devolving powers to the panchayat level, to the village level. Powers to get elected is there, but no money powers. So the frustration at that level of 1.5 million people who are very close to their voters is, yes, I'm getting elected, and it's a clear five-year term. Come what may, the election will have to happen because that's a mandatory condition given in the Constitution Amendment Bill. Every five years, election happens. But those representatives do not have the authority or the money that they have to spend in their uh, constituency and therefore are really hamstrung. And voters get disgusted every five years saying, I've elected you, you've not done anything here. And therefore they believe it is the legislative assembly member who will do it or even the member of parliament who will do it. So we have kept the whole process so cloistered, end of the day, those objectives with which the amendment was passed to have local self-government, they've become ineffective. And I wouldn't say it will continue like that for very long, because if you had followed um, Mr. Mehta's, Dr. Mehta's presentation in the morning, the old systems are breaking down. That's, uh, that's one thing. The other layer I'm coming out with is to explain the political system, which I've been asked to very briefly talk about. I, I hope I'm not running out of my eight minutes. 
political elections happen on a territorial constituency basis. Whether you're getting elected at the village level or at the state level or even at the national level for the parliament, it is a territorially marked area. And the Indian constitution expected the territorial uh, uh, borders to be uh, redefined every 10 years because we also have put in place reservations for certain uh, uh, deprived classes, SCs or STs, and also if they were going to bring in a bill for reservation for women, these delimitations and areas for representation of these uh, reserved communities will have to be adequate and justified and rotated. But delimitations don't happen very often. In fact, we've defied it or postponed it by every 20 years or 15 years. And therefore, this has become a cause for what in the last two, three days, the common uh, word of interest, the middle class, feeling frustrated. The urban and the rural middle class, again using Dr. Mehta's analysis of voice or exit, till today thought they don't have a voice. But they are now voicing the middle class, both urban and rural, who have access to technology, are voicing their feelings through the social media. Largely all that you heard of the civil society and their movement was supported by a huge voice which was supported from behind through the technology, the social media, encouraging the civil society organizations. What is it that they wanted? To be heard. Urban middle class particularly, and now even some sections of the rural middle class have never been heard because they never bothered to come and vote. But today they are being heard and I guess from 2014 election, there will also be a greater participation of the urban middle class. I'm clearly being reminded to wind up. My suggestions as regards the way forward is I think India should very clearly review what has been provided by the constitution. An attempt was made during one of the earlier governments for whatever reasons that's been dumped because a large section of people which are thinly spread across very many constituencies, territorial constituencies, who really cannot otherwise influence voting because they are spread so thin, would probably look at the way in which probably they can have a better voice heard if there was a proportional representation. I'm not suggesting this as a spokesperson of my party saying, oh, we stand for proposed proportional rep representation. But we certainly stand for reviewing and looking into the constitution whether it is giving adequate representation for everything, everybody. That is one thing. And second, way forward again, would be to adequately empower financially the local bodies where you brought in this huge layer of directly elected political class. They have, after all, got to answer. So the Indian problem is a larger problem, but we have also uh, carefully stepped forward in smaller steps. They have to be empowered. Uh, well, thank you very much. I don't think I can speak more on this. I think probably in the circumstances it might be best if I allowed the Congress party spokesman to speak next, next <laughs> given that <laughs> BJP has just thank been. So, if, excuse me, thank you very much. Excuse me for your forbearance. I think it is better I should stand up to speak. Otherwise, she, she may make allegation that arrogantly they are sitting and talking <laughs> to the audience. I have been given only eight minutes. In our parliament, if a speaker grants yeah, eight minutes, that we are in habit to speak 18 minutes. <laughs> but I would not follow our parliament. But you were actually, given time, so. <laughs> actually, there is no democracy which may you call perfect system. Different democracies are there in different parts of the country. If you go to Switzerland, on each and every issue, they go to the people for referendum and to find out what the people they want. You go to United States, it is presidential system. You go to United Kingdom, it is parliamentary system. You come to Australia, it is 50-50. If you, you want to become senator, then it is uh, a proportional representation. If you want to become a member of a uh, lower house then on the basis of preferential votes you are to be elected. Actually, when Australia was giving voting right 
to every citizen of Australia, in Australia in 1855, we started our battle for freedom. We were fighting for our freedom. When in 19th, uh, uh, one century ago, you gave constitution to your country, we had no knowledge whether we will get freedom or not. And in 1947, we got freedom. Our forefathers, they paid price for this. It was not by chance. We paid blood. We paid our lives, and then we got independence. Basically, we had no knowledge how to rule the country. 400, 500 years, Mughal emperors, they ruled over our country. Then more than 150 years, British people, they ruled over India. And I remember it is the part of history when Prime Minister Churchill said, it is not possible for Indians to run their democracy. Even if we grant them democracy, it will be difficult for them to run their government. But we have proved it. I am proud of our system. For last three days, I am observing different points of view, and most of these speakers, they are criticizing Indian system, Indian political system. I, I will not mind to say I am proud of my system. We are very successful. In last 65 years, India has given very, very stable government, very, very established democracy. Yes, of course, we have to reform. Reform is needed in judiciary. Reform is needed in bureaucracy. Reform in, is needed in police system. But in last 65 years, the entire world is looking, tomorrow India may be one of the biggest powers of this world. There is no doubt in it. For the last 20 years, of course, there is a coalition government in India. We are facing so many problems. I will not mind to say that there is no problem in our country, whether it is uh, corruption or other problems we are facing. But at the same time, all of you will be surprised to know in 1947, when our first finance minister tabled the budget of the country, it was, you know that it was how much amount? It was only 200 crore, 197 crore. Roughly, if you calculate, I think it is $40 million. It, the first budget of independent India. $40 million, 197 crore, and the deficit was 26 crore. We started our journey from there. Today, I think more than 1 lakh people, 10 million people, they, they are having more than $40 million. This is our India. And last, last year, our finance minister, Panna Mukherjee, who is now president of India, he has given the budget of the country of 15 lakh crore. I am unable to calculate in dollars, but roughly it is not less than 3,000 billion dollars. We started our journey from there, and now we have reached here. It is not our destination. Still, we have to go ahead. Still, we have to go forward. And I assure you that one day we will reach the air, we will achieve our destination in spite of so many problems. For the last 20 years, there is coalition government. Earlier, government was the government of 26 parties' government, NTA's government, which lasted six years smoothly. And for the last eight years, it is our government. It is also a coalition government of four or five parties. Definitely, there are certain problems. When there is a coalition government, there are so many problems. But there is very smooth transfer of power. It is only in India. 
about eight years back when Abul Kalam was the president of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh was the prime minister of India. They both belong to a minority community. And that community is hardly 15% in the country. It has never happened in any part of, of the world. Prime Minister and President both belong to minority community. An entire country, they may criticize, but they had complete faith in both of them. In 1947, when we got independence, our neighboring country got independence one day earlier. And they declared that it is an Islamic state. Our country's religion is Islam. We got independence after 24 hours. But there was no reaction at all in our country. Our leadership, in spite of this, declared a secular state. Every citizen of the country will have the same powers, equal powers. This is our strength. That is the reason I say that we have to go ahead and we will go ahead. We will achieve our destination. Certainly today and the entire world, we are talking that India will become a member of Security Council of United Nations. I am sure one day we will get it. We will achieve it. And India will be one of the powers of the world, whether it is economically or politically. We will, poverty is there, but my friend from planning commission is sitting over here. When we got independence, okay, I'm going to conclude. <laughs> I will not take it in minutes. He knows it very well. We got, when we got independence, more than 50% population were living below poverty line. Today, it is hardly 30% of the population which is living below poverty line. One thing, if you just grant me one minute, I will say, people are criticizing political persons of members of parliament of India. It is only a member of Lok Sabha who knows how to manage. In our country, one constituency, my constituency, I have been now, I'm a member of Rajya Sabha. Earlier I was in Lok Sabha. I have 1,500 villages. I have represented 2.5 million population. I have represented 1.5 million voters. When you start from one village to the last village, it takes six months to approach the people. And when you again back to first village, they ask you, for last six months, where are you? <laughs> it is not easy. It is not easy. So member of Lok Sabha in India, he, he makes his all efforts to satisfy the people of the country. I am very thankful, Professor Mattu, you give me this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm probably okay, but you come up. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Rashid. I think uh, I, what I saw when you got up to speak was an Indian politician in full flight. <laughs> so I was hesitant to interrupt. Uh, but you acquitted yourself with credit. Thank you. Okay, Jude, uh, I've introduced you. Look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't think it works. I yeah. think it's been oh. turned off down there. See how it goes. Sorry, I had to come to the lectern because my father suffered Alzheimer's, so I don't take chances. <laughs> so I had to have my notes. First of all, uh, when I got the floor, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the very talented Professor Amitabh Mato and his very talented team for putting together a very thought-provoking and informative uh, conference, and thank you very much. And also, i like to thank everybody contributed uh, to the conference. And i like to welcome everybody who came from all corners of the world to attend this conference. Uh, 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 sorry to interrupt you, but this has been streamed live, and you can't be photographed there. You have to come here. Is it? <laughs> oh, wow. Well. 
see how it goes. <laughs> but I can pull together. You have wasted two minutes. <laughs> oh, <wow. coughs> I'll get ten. All right, I'll get on to it. I'm sure you like to hear something about the Australian system, and therefore I'll stick to the uh, topic uh, Australian political system and the political class. The, in a dynamic world, everything changed except the change itself. That's why in 2008, Obama ran the presidential campaign under the slogan, Change We Need. And in the Britain, David Cameron asked for a vote for change. Now, in Australia, it is very difficult for a long-term government to get re-elected because people are looking for the change. Well, where can we have the change? To have the change, we have the democracy and we have the multi-party system. If you don't have the multi-party system, you don't have the political polarization. When people are politically polarized, have different views, then it kicks in the different political parties. In Australia, some leaders of the trade union movement became convinced about 1890 that a different form of political mobilization was necessary to face the consequences of the severe economic depression and the hardened attitudes of the employers. So the Australian Labour Party, first political party, was born in Queensland, 1890. In the 1944, the second major party, Liberal Party, was born, and the leader, Robert Menzies, outlined the vision of the party as a political movement for national power and national progress and for the full development of the individual citizen, though not through the dull and deadening process of socialism. This indicates that Labour Party was based on the welfare, interest, and value of society of working families, while the Liberal Party is based on individual advancement and individual values and interests. Moral beliefs and moral values appear to be very serious concerns in USA, not to that extent in Australia. So political parties have based over the period it has shifted, but the core still remains political parties, not only Labour Liberal, but the other minor parties as National and Greens, they have their own political basis. Polarization of these beliefs and values can be seen through the media, social media, direct mailing, letterboxing, television advertisement, to name a few. However, 60% of the legislation introduced to Australian parliaments, or over 60% of the legislation, have a passage unopposed. Unfortunately, a lot of Australian citizens do not understand that. The minority of the legislation have a division. Whatever creates the division, public interest, and whatever creates the division, creates the public interest. Polarization not only takes part within, uh, with, in parliaments or within political parties or political class, as mentioned, and political circle. It soon trickled down to the masses via the way, as I mentioned, through media and other methods. Human beings are pretty much victims of their own circumstances. Circumstances encountered throughout your life will, of course, shape the morals and values of the thought process and subsequently your decision-making uh, ability. One might argue for the right of a woman to make choices about her body and life. The other might argue the right of every life. Those who believe in climate change will strongly argue for measures to lead the way to save the world from potential environmental disasters. The climate change skeptics might argue for a position for doing nothing or just follow the tail end of the nation states taking action. Hence, polarization of political views are not limited to the political class. It's widespread in our society. To satisfy their own political basis, Policies can be implemented only in government, not in opposition. So political class very well realized that 
That is why they would like to hang on to government or remain in government if they are in government. That is why in election campaigns, sometimes some political parties commit with full knowledge that those commitments cannot be delivered even if they get into a stable government of their own. Then once they get into the government, they start blaming the previous government or any other Australian jurisdiction because they can't deliver the, what, what they have promised. Outside election period, the political class can involve in personal attacks, total negativity, imposing almost to everything against the government under the sun. So these are not a permanent uh, feature of our political system, but it happens time to time. The dimensions of the actions also depends on the leadership uh, of the time. Sometimes government could go to the extent of retaining people in the ranks who have misused public system or parliamentary privileges. These are the behaviors that undermines the governance. It's not the political polarization according to my thinking. In general, an opposition might continue to oppose every major political position of the government if they feel their actions will get them up in the polls. Why would they not do it? Because they continue to enjoy the higher position in the polls. On the same time, the governments can implement unethical, unsavory, short-sighted policies if, if they are doing if their uh, place improves in the polls. Climbing up in polls is, give me some time, thank you. <laughs> Climbing up in the polls is drive the, uh, drive the political decision making in this country, which is in a sense, which is unfortunate, but it can only combat by, in my view, providing long-term government so that people can uh, get involved with the community and uh, and sell their positions rather than rather than drive policies on short term poll driven positions and also i would say in the victorian parliament we have the parliamentary committee system which works very well we, we go out there doing do fact finding involved in fact finding missions call for submissions conduct public uh, uh, inquiries and uh, uh, provide recommendations to the government. That some, some legislation is based on such uh, recommendations. So something that something can be expanded so that we can get more people involved in the system that will be more inclusive. Because of the time constraints, um, I will have to wind up there. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jude, very much for your forbearance in my asking you to wind up, but thank you very much. Greg. Uh, uh, Professor Matu, uh, John McCarthy, ladies and gentlemen, I have eight minutes and I would like to uh, add my thanks to the Australia India Institute under Amitav Matu's leadership, which has been such a dynamic element of um, the Australia India relationship these last couple of years. It's an honour to share a panel with John McCarthy and uh, the other distinguished panellists. Now, although Amitav Matu is a friend of mine, he has put me in the most dangerous position any human being can occupy. I stand between a conference and its lunch. <laughs> I, also, I also find myself somewhat in the position of Elizabeth Taylor's seventh husband on his wedding night. I do understand roughly what I'm supposed to do, but I have no idea how I'm going to make it interesting or novel. Um, <laughs> I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you just three very brief points. Uh, about the political culture and the way forward. I think Australia is going through an extraordinarily bad period of governance at the moment. Australian politicians, God bless them, many of them are friends of mine, many of them have leaked to me prodigiously over the years, I love them for that and cherish them, uh, have a great tendency to pat themselves on the back for doing the obvious. You know, we inherited a British system of law and a, a nation the size of a continent replete with vast minerals and we've become modestly affluent. By God, we're geniuses, you know. And, um, <laughs> and at the moment, we are a nation running on autopilot. We've done something remarkable. We've taken the British electoral system and produced an Israeli parliamentary outcome as a result. 
and we have a spectacularly incoherent parliament which has reached a kind of postmodern phase where it has no meaning in the physical universe. Uh, I, I wrote a column uh, this week saying that the Asian white paper the government has just uh, produced is essentially an exercise in medieval theology. It's a question of how many Asian languages can dance on the head of a pin. It will have no consequence in the real world. Nothing which a government does in Australia at the moment which does not involve funding and action immediately can be taken seriously. In 2009, the government produced a defence white paper, immensely serious business, billions of dollars, hard funding commitments, tens of thousands of jobs hanging off it, submarines, fighter aeroplanes, all kinds of real things. It was not implemented for one minute of one day and we now have defence expenditure at the lowest level as a share of national wealth that it's been since 1938. So an Asian white paper which has no funding and no real world commitment attached to it has no meaning. And at the moment our politics is wallowing in a kind of postmodern surrealism where uh, and you get as much credit for an announcement as you get for actually doing something. Therefore, why bother with the tedious business of actually doing anything? You just make announcements endlessly. <laughs> we also have the shortest uh, uh, cycle of governments in the world and therefore even, even long-term announcements are essentially short-term decisions about the election, which is never more than a week and a half away. How we're going to... The, the only consolation in all this is that there is a lot of truth to the old American nostrum that a government which governs least tends to govern best, and the fact that our governments at the moment can't do anything at all means that they can't do much harm. I suppose there's some <laughs> consolation in that. If I were to offer... So that's my first point. My second point is if I were to offer uh, a, a policy priority for Australia in the years ahead, it would be to refocus on growth, economic growth and population growth. We have a wonderful opportunity at the moment. There are many high-qualified, well-educated potential immigrants from India, China, Eastern Europe and other parts of the world, and we want in Australia quality and quantity. There are 23 million of us at the moment. Quite a few people in the world think that what the world needs is fewer and better Australians. I don't agree with them. <laughs> I think we, we, need, we need more Australians. And as a nation, we are simply not going to be able to cope with the Asian century if we are 25 million old and declining. We'll be much better able to cope if we are 37 million young and growing. And uh, these nostrums, which used to be central to Australian politics, have become unfashionable at the moment, but I think they're, they're our central task. We should concentrate on economic growth and population growth. And finally... Um, I do think we need to make India a central priority of our, of our national purpose. Um, we've done this in the past. In the 1950s, we decided that we would hook ourselves to Japan. This was an extremely unlikely thing to do, given that we'd fought a terribly bitter war against Japan only a decade previously. But we did it with some success. And, of course, the success reflects on the Japanese as well. Then in the 80s, we decided that we would do the same with China. Again, quite a difficult thing to do because, uh, you know, I don't want to be impolite about this, but China is, after all, a communist dictatorship and that um, uh, some captious people regard political values as having some consequence. And uh, so it was a hurdle to jump, but we did so successfully, developed an important uh, economic relationship with China. Now, with India, of course, there are none of those barriers. It offers everything that Japan and China offered, but it offers so much more because there are cultural and political and linguistic and cricket and other values that we share in common. But, of course, with our Australian perversity, it is likely that having succeeded in the difficult cases, we will fail in the relatively straightforward case. But uh, we need champions of this... Uh, policy perspective in our national life. We've had too few of them. The Australia India Institute has become a very important champion in recent years. And my final reflection is, I love the title of this conference, The Argumentative Indian. You know, um, uh, my wife, as some of you know, <coughs> is, uh, is a Sikh. And uh, so I am constitutionally bound to support Manmohan Singh at any stage of his prime <laughs> ministership, no matter what happens, really. 
And it's often said of the Sikhs that they are a great warlike people. You know, they have fantastic warrior uh, uh, um, traditions. And after 20 years of marriage um, uh, between an argumentative Australian and a, and, a, and a commanding Sikh, I can only say that they are indeed a warlike people and it's best not to get on their wrong side. <laughs> Well, Greg, having kept uh, absolutely to eight minutes, I can assure you I'm not going to stand between this conference and his lunch. Uh, so I think we might cut off Q&A. Uh, nice though it might have been, I think hunger is probably more important. So uh, thank you all very much, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you.